refereeing's been dominating this week. As ever, uh, on Monday, a video was released of referee David Coote strongly criticising Liverpool and making comments about Jurgen Klopp. This was followed up on Wednesday by another video of him snorting a white powder. Referees, as ever, of, seem to be front and centre. I'm delighted to say we're now joined by Keith Hackett, former boss of the PGMOL. Keith, good morning. Good morning. Keith, it seems to me that referees are, are in the spotlight, and, and rightly so in the case of David Coop, but all the time now. I mean, back in your day when you were refing, was this the case? I don't remember it being the case where everything about referees was being discussed daily. Well, that might be the case, but I think generally the forensic examination of the sport, football, as it's evolved in recent times with the startup of the Premier League, 22 cameras examine every decision. Let's be fair, uh, be clear. Six years in, and VAR is not working to the benefit of the game. And neither do I think it's working to the benefit of the uh, referee. I think it's. I think it has created lazy refereeing. Um, I don't think the process is correct. I think that is why FIFA are examining this alternative of a, a challenge system. We haven't seen the introduction of the semi-automated system. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that is because they're not buying off the shelf the existing pro, uh, sort of Sony cum Orkai system. They're evolving their own uh, set of cameras and ball technology. The revelations around uh, David Coop, I thought were dealt with very quickly by the PGMOL. Mm -hmm. He is an employee, and I and I want to put up the fact that they have a duty of care towards him. Mm -hmm. I don't like, I dislike intensely what he's done because he's tarnished the image of referees in, a, in this period of time. Uh, but they have this duty of care. Most of the referees in my era, and I think the same in terms of the setup of the PGMOL, became members of the Unite Union. So if... Coote is a member of the Unite Union. He will, in fact, uh, be supported by them. And obviously, the PGMOL, through a small team that will be set up of experts, uh, they will have to examine it in detail. Keith, hi, it's Henry here. Just on, hi, Henry. just sort of speaking generally, is is there drug testing for uh, for officials? I think this is a. <laughs> Uh, a, a great question. I, I, I smile a little bit because in the early 2000s, when I took over the PGMOL, Henry, we, we had the problems of uh, corruption with some referees in Europe. I, I, I thought, you know, I'd inherited a group of referees with a great level of integrity. Uh, I still believe that, apart from the coup situation. I then said, much to the concern of the board at the time, I'm going to ban... Uh, gambling on football worldwide with these referees. I'd already provided them with laptops and phones, and this is not being subversive. It was me trying to have an element of protection for my employees so I could examine those laptops. I could examine the phones if I needed to. Cool. I never had to do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, was a benefit when, when I had to deal with the Clattenburg case and the Mike Dean case, which they were fat, they were exonerated, uh, uh, but we went through the same process. I also, at that same time, put to the board that we should have uh, drug testing. I had no suspicion, um, but I felt it was a barrier. Um, you know, I'd seen the impact of WADA on other sports. I'd been to the 88 Olympics. I'd seen how they worked there, and I thought, look, our guys are sportsmen, they're professional, and I wanted to bring that in. The board at the time, um, I thought their rationale was, was reasonable, and that was, Keith, if we, if we go out and people find out in the way that you're trying to be transparent, that we are drug testing, suspicion will rise and the media will get onto the negative side of it. At the time, I said I could, I could probably deal with that, which, which I, in fairness, I could have. So, no, I think a long answer, Henry, but an important one, I don't think they are drug tested. I do believe that that's got to come in.
So, so Keith, j- just to clarify, when you were head of PGMOL, you would have had the right to have asked them to hand over their phones and laptops. Yes. If, if we needed, uh, as in the case of the two that I suspended, two referees that I suspended, uh, we were in a position to be able to examine that. We, You know, look, it, this is part of duty of care. This is not suspicion, Henry. This is being professional mm. uh, in our approach because, look, <laughs> there's billions of pounds involved in football. And I, I was concerned of the approaches that have been made in Europe. You know, uh, some ex-referees languishing in jail. Oh, I never wanted that reputation that the likes of Jack Taylor, Pat Partridge, Clive Thomas and others had built. I didn't want that putting at risk. I felt it was my duty to put in systems that protect as an employer. Weirdly, Keith, it's not so much what David Coote's done for me, it is how it puts the refereeing profession in such a bad light and, and exposes them, I suppose, to to accusations, as Robbie Fowler yes. says this morning, of bias. And also, and I'm not saying this has happened in David Coote's case, it probably hasn't, you're open to levels possibly bribery, corruption. Um, it, it, it makes it really, really difficult for other refs going forward. And that, for me, is, is the bit which is which is crucial here. Absolutely, I agree 100%. You know, I, my inbox is full of appalling messages about corruption and lack of integrity and all that goes. Look, referees are human. They're just like players. They make mistakes, but they're at the forefront of the decision-making process. <laughs> we, we've all questioned uh, the ability uh, in terms of VAR. I, I'm, I'm a bit of a technophobe. I brought in the communication kits. I also brought in goal line technology. I work with Orkai. I know that the technology in VAR is not as good as it should be. And that is why, rightly, the, the FIFA and UEFA brought in a semi-automated system to speed up that process. I still believe football is behind the curveball in terms of how to use it. I'm still for... Having watched Rugby Union and how they operate, having watched cricket and how they operate the system, I see no problem with the big screens being used in the stadiums and the communication link, what is going on, is is transmitted within the stadium. So fans are involved in the process. Because they're not, and look, fans will always have a degree of bias but because they're not involved and we know the process is not right, we know that when a referee is sent to the, to the monitor, he's going he's gonna to change his decision he's, because he's influenced by what is being said on the way to the, to, to the monitor. And because it's supposed to be a clear and obvious uh, interruption, he, he's, he's automatically on the back, back foot saying, well, I must be wrong. And I, and I, and I think that that process... Um, they try and make as, as, as best a job as they possibly can, but I think the criteria needs to be sharpened up. I saw a Howard Webb on this programme trying to uh, educate and, and, and be transparent in how VAR operates, and I, and I, I applaud him for that. But, but one thing that worried me was to say there's only been two errors this season. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I found that incredible. And then when I listen in to what's going off on the on the mic, I'm telling you as a referee, I've got to have 100% concentration. And whilst the crowd I can blank out, somebody in my ear having a stupid conversation that is unhelpful, the criteria needs to be sharpened up. And we need to get professional in that approach. Well, I mean, we've got two issues going on here, haven't we? We've got VAR. Uh, which is which yes. constant, and the coot issue. I just wonder what happens at the referees' training centre. I mean, would you have gathered them all together and say, right, this afternoon or this morning, we're going to sit down, we're going to have a meeting, we're going to thrash out everything, you give them a hard word, they say a few things, and you say, from here on now, we're going to sort everything out. It's all going to be resolved with a massive stomach meeting. I don't care if it takes till midnight. Well, you know... What you're talking about is the process that I used to go through every two weeks when I brought mm-hmm. them into Staverton and into Warwick University. Because, look, 
Referees will always make errors. What we have to do is, is try to educate and inform about avoiding them. So the referees would come in. Uh, we would have the, the, the film clips on the, on the screen. We'd even have the referee talking through how he came to that decision, right? And then we'll discuss it as a team. But what about David Coo? We... What would you have done with that? When everybody well, came uh, in, David Coote, of course, is 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 out of the scene. Yeah, but um, refs will be asking you, "What that... do we do about this? We've been put in a vulnerable position, in a sense. How 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 would you deal with it?" Well, I think first of all, remember we we we've got experts around the place that can assist. But my mm -hmm. view is that we have to have a one to one with every referee, uh, and uh, I think that. The, the board, of, I would be recommending to the PGMLL board that um, we bring in drug testing and I'd probably get that approval pretty quick and then I'd do it straight away. That's my first line of, of approach. Keith, just on uh, the transparency, would you encourage IFAB to allow referees to talk after games, whether it's just to the host broadcasters, just to clarify decisions so we don't get this huge speculation amongst sort of people like me in the media and obviously online? Well, the, the reality is, if, if you recall, we've both been in the game a long time, Henry, and I did, in fact, when I took on the PGMLL, start that process. And, and the reality was we had Rob Stiles uh, very eloquently explaining why he'd made a decision. He talked through very honestly. But it, it appeared that the uh, board at the time were, un, were, were not too happy. I think that's because, being honest, it's, it actually suppressed the ongoing programmes of phone-ins and various other things. And they were quite happy for that to, to evolve and, and grow. My view is... I did th these guys, I, I, I put them through media training. I had an expert in how to deal with the questions. And I felt that was part of the system that they should have anyway. I have no problem with that. And I, I, I do think the IFAB, and remember that's made up of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. And yes, FIFA have the, the greatest power. Put these things forward in a, in a logical manner. There's no reason why it couldn't be done. You know, I, at the end of the day, we, we don't go out with the intentions of messing the game up. Now, one of the other things that clubs were unhappy about, Henry, was this. When we actually explained why a red card had been issued, the club involved was very, very unhappy because they felt that it le left them with no option to be able to appeal against that red card, that we were having a second opportunity to have a bang at underpinning that red card. So the, the, these were the issues at the time. And therefore, uh, you know, the board uh, in charge decided, look, we'll, we'll not proceed. Keith Hackett, bouncy, spiky, uh, analytical and brilliant as ever. Keith, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Keith. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.